since this thread is getting very close to bad thread. Time for a story time I once played a mute character who was a riot and horrified the group as a whole. Our GM started up the game with the description like a slightly dark version of Firefly, where you're a ragtag group that's ended up in possession of a ship that you're sharing now. I know my GM well. Slightly dark meant herp grown dark and he'd ran this setting before. It was a personal favorite of his, so I was prepared and armed on what to expect. So I'll decide to make a character that'll at least be fun and entertaining to play while the entire game rolls in the mud like a pig with special needs. So, I decided to team up with another guy in my group and we took a shared background. We decided early on that we'd be pretty much space tramps. Totally unheroic. Only out for ourselves and the cash and doomed to forever wander the space ways with no expectations beyond that. Since the GM never looked at backgrounds anyway or incorporated them into the game. So, fuck it. Why bother going for some great epic as my friend put it we decided to be from a sort of industrial hellhole of a world. Literally the most fucking grim dark place we could think up together. Run by the space mafia. On an inhospitable planet in a bubble dome which was slowly falling apart. Outside the dome it was like lost planet. Only with more radiation. The shittiest shithole to ever be shit. And his character would be from the upper class while mine was from the hardcore oppressed lower class. If our GM wanted Grimdark, we'd do Grimdark. And so I created Arta. Now, the best way to explain Arta is through his background. He came from the worst areas of the radioactive bubble dome Russia Mafia surf ghetto and was the son of a mechanic. For someone growing up in such an area he was when he was younger a pretty outgoing and charming guy. With lots of natural ability in his job to be as a mechanic. A nice guy, with a good future. Well, by local standards until the day he met Anya. Anya was the most beautiful woman he'd ever met. It took all his charm, garland charm to court her, because Anya was the daughter of a member of the space mafia, the Don's daughter in fact. To cut a long backstory short, my friend was a member of the space mafia who Arta befriended, or a would-be member who had a lot of prospects. Arta got found out after hitting that and was going to be made an example of, in every way possible, Michiel, my friend's character saved him from the execution by breaking him out after 8 long days of inventive and very damaging torture. They hijacked a ship and escaped the planet, never to return. Now, Arta was a wreck of a human being, totally alienated by his trauma and years in a space with only Michiel for company. His entire body was one big scar and he never took off his helmet in public or let anyone in. He'd torn his vocal cords screaming during his time with the Mafia and while a tech and mechanical genius. A fantastic shot with a shotgun and razor sharp. He could not talk to anyone. Max points in social floors and a custom floor which meant while he wasn't a such mute, he would never talk, unless Michiel's life was in danger. Now, he and Michiel had a very tense relationship, because while Arta would die for Michiel, they were brothers in arms, with Michiel being the charm and Grease and Arta being the shipsman. There was always an underlying tension where Arta felt Michiel resented him, which he did but not as much as Arta thought and it was all very complicated and entertaining. Michiel would get them the jobs. Arta was happy to spend days locked up on tiny little two-man ships, never suffered from the space crazies because he was so incredibly misanthropic and afraid of other people and their judging stares and so they worked together well. Michiel still dreamed of more, while Arta dreamed of nothing because dreams put him in this shit as it was. And this was our very strange pair. Michiel was full on charm. Booseness and lacking in scruples. Arta was good-hearted still under his terrible, mutilated exterior and the reflective helmet, but ruthless in his own way. Intelligent as fuck with machines. Strong as hell and listened to carry a shotgun. He was the only PC who started the game having killed anyone. Having blown away would be space pirates in the past for trying to board their ship. He could set up traps, beat a man to death with a monkey wrench, or blow him away. Good thing too since I was the only one in the group who took combat skills. So, that was our duo, space hermit male Hester Shaw and the world's biggest asshole and charmer. We thought we were prepared. We thought we were ready for the grim derp and the bad gmin and the terrible story. Ready to ride it out on an awesome wave of space brass. Apathy. Low expectations of reward and general preparedness for it to be bad. Oh boy we were not. Not for this one. 
So, rest of the group prepares. We get three other members of our jolly ship of fools. A female space doctor who was the life and soul of the party wherever she went and utterly unprepared for the harsh reality of being a space jockey. Another mechanic who had worked as a miner before and was a decent enough lady. And the calculator. You heard me right. That was his name. To give you his background in short an infamous space hacker carrying stolen plans for incredibly advanced prototypes who's able to build robots and crap from scraps. Has the paranoia flaw meaning he'll never really trust the party and has no morals or sense of camaraderie so someone who really had no reason to be there would fuck us over and who had a bunch of special awesome powers while the rest of us were pretty low tone. We're doing this over I'm. So I'm just sitting there. Staring at the screen as he describes his incredibly badass glorified space nerd, and my hand reaches for the bottle of whiskey I keep in my desk, ready to play the entire game drunk to avoid this bullshit, or at least so I can't remember it. Mitchell IMs me and we agree, this is BS. Still, as long as he plays it low tone who cares, we're here to do our job, not pick fights am I right? So, we prepare for the game to start. It starts 5 minutes later. In a strip club. On a space station. Now I know you're thinking that GM for one reason. But he isn't. In fact he's the kind of guy who prudes out if people play characters of the opposite gender. Go figure. So GM starts to describe how we're all meeting here because this is where the con man who we invested in the company of was going to meet us here. We have nothing but the clothes on our backs and the things in our pockets. GM tells us to describe what we're doing. Mitchell describes how he's flirting with one or two of the strippers. The others describe what they are doing. GM looks to me. You getting involved in all this nope. I'm sitting in the corner with a book on the physics of hyperspace travel and a coke GM takes 10 seconds to react to that. Probably wondering what the fuck. Anyway, Mitchell rolls to seduce and the GM deems that he auto fails because apparently strippers are all chased as fuck and not interested in men flirting with them. Even with minus 100 successes because his very words are like melted chocolate dripping into your ears and so forth. So, he gives up on that and goes and talks to the others. I remain in the corner reading and giving no fucks as Arthur is uncomfortable as hell since it's a wide open area with lots of people. He's got his helmet on very firmly in place and has opened it about an inch so he can put the straw through the gap to drink. Arthur is that one kid at every party who sits in the corner wearing a party hat while everyone else is hammered and making out basically. Suddenly some random waitress comes over and asks me if I'd like another drink. I hold up a note, which reads I am sorry, but I am a mute. Cannot speak, then tap the half empty glass and nod, signifying I want another one. So she gets me another delicious space cola trademark and I continue to read my book. Because who needs semi-naked women when you have starship engines she comes back and sits down. What and asks me what I'm reading. I give her a re stare for a moment because I am supposedly mute. Good luck talking to me. Then I take out one of those mechanical voice machines which I bought in my background and start a conversation with her. Definitely not flirting or anything. God no. Arta knows about the dangers of women. But weirdly enough she is flirting back. Apparently this random waitress has a thing for socially retarded men in spacesuits. Maybe it's her fetish or something. I don't know. Mitchell points out this is a bit weird. GM answers with well, strippers are used to people flirting with them and cheesy pickup lines. Arthur is sitting in the corner not watching and reading. Which is definitely out of the ordinary so it's interesting alright. Some kind of logic there. Not good logic but hey. So Mitchell is off with the others doing his charm thing while I'm trapped by this very forward waitress who is trying to seduce me. When the calculator deems to grace us with his presence. So he grabs a seat in the corner to brood. Mitchell comes over and joins us. Explaining that we're going to go check on the ship now and get some work because we've been dicked over by our boss who ran off with all our money. My character instantly makes a series of hand signs which translate as save me from this woman help and dodges out the way so Mitchell can save me and at this point I realize what the GM is trying to do. Until this point I hadn't described what Arthur looks like under his suit. So he's trying to get my suit off me. Well good luck with that bitch, Arthur hates the world and that suit is his armor against it. That and his silence. To cut a long story short. Turns out the random waitress was the youngest daughter of the man who runs the station. Who is a sort of criminal. 
Mitchell gets brought in for flirting with both his daughters in one night. Apparently this all powerful man rolling in all the monies lets his daughters work at strip clubs. So we end up getting dragged into a favor for him, delivering some totally legit medicine to our planet, while Arta was off getting his own job for us. And ran into a bunch of refugees, who are running from a war, or criminals, or something and are trapped on the station because no one local will take them off, at the command of the crookmaster. Arta's reaction to that is the non-vocal equivalent of fuck that noise you're coming with us even if you can't pay that much. The GM is as aware that I am a morale fag as I am aware he's an asshole it seems. Now we all actually properly meet for the first time in a cafe having spent some time working alone to find jobs. The moment we meet, the calculator decides he doesn't like or trust me and is going to be an asshole to the mute who won't stand up for himself. Why I'll never know, I'm about twice his size. Kinda like a skinny fat guy trying to bully a pro wrestler but hey, I'm here to do a job not rock the boat, so I won't pick fights. Mitchell does, he tells him to fuck off, get off my case or leave because we have a larger stake between us than he does. The calculator decides to interpret this as you can pick fights with the huge space suit bear man but you'd better be passive aggressive about it so we all put our job offers on the table. From Mitchell we have the totally legit drug run from the slightly less legit man. From the mechanic we have a fuel run from me. We have the mercy run which I point out wouldn't be a mission in and of itself since they don't want to go anywhere specific, just drop them off wherever. From the calculator, we have a very dodgy and dangerous sounding mechanical parts run for the station boss man, which we all know means drugs. And he's already accepted the pay for it. And he lies about how much he got and says since he got the job, he's getting 45% and we get 15 each, except me, I'm getting 10% as he splits it up equally for us. Oh and if it doesn't arrive on time or we try to back out apparently we're going to have consequences on our asses. Mathefica. Oh and he's totally against helping the refugees because they can't pay his exorbitant fees, when it was my job and I set the fee, which is about a tenth of what he's decided they're going to pay, since I know how little people have and he thinks we're transporting the Sultan of Brunei or something and because I suggested it, double Mathurfica, so Machiel backs me up, we are taking them with us and after a long argument the digital pocket abacus backs down in the face of everyone else going no, shut up we're taking them. Also Mitchell casually mentions we're getting an extra crew member. The local gang boss's daughter who wants to see the world and ok I instantly know it's because the GM is setting the sexual equivalent of a tracks a hound on my character. Having obviously not read my backstory, the amount of coincidence is horrific. Arta looks at him for about 30 seconds in total silence, as he digests that and runs through all the ways this is a bad idea, how it could result in a repeat of history and how this is a terrible thing. My character carefully takes out his mechanical writing pad, then writes something, scratches it out, writes something, scratches it out, writes something else, then turns it around. Small letters nope. Crossed out larger letters nope also crossed out entire page nope underlined twice one session later we leave with the mechanical parts the refugees, the medicine and the damn girl. Why this very important mafia type person is entrusting his daughter to a group of space hobos who met just yesterday at a strip club, who knows. But he has him send along two big bulky bodyguards, who will instantly label railroad assistant one and voice of the GM1. So we take off. The doctor and Arta have a chat and she's friendly enough. She finds out quickly he can't talk and he takes off his helmet when we get on the ship. She tactfully asks him about his horrifically damaged face. He claims it was an accident. He hangs out with our aloof female engineer who has a fetish for hyperspace engines and they get on well. Oddly enough Arta seems to get on with almost everyone. Despite never talking. Being a creepy faceless man in a space suit who never takes off his helmet and never initiating conversation really. After the game ends. It turns out every member of the female crew liked him well enough and several of them were interested in starting up a love side plot with the mysterious, scarred, voiceless man. Two of them even agreed to share him and do a love triangle subplot for a bit of drama and a laugh. So Arta was some sort of fucked up harem protagonist through no fault of my own. Go figure. Maybe it's sexual charisma or something. I don't know. Or he's just the lowest common denominator. 
Not much happens for most the trip. Arthur disappears into the bowls of the ship to be in his element dicking about with the internals of the ship and having no human contact. So while the others do drama side plots and shit, I sit on the sidelines and eat popcorn occasionally rolling dice to repair shit. It was kinda cool being able to sit back like that and just go working on the ship and have people unable to find my character. The calculator claims pilot seat. Despite Mitchell being a better pilot, and refuses to give it up because piloting is my thing. He starts sleeping in the cockpit and shit and keeps it locked off most the time, which should have been a hint of things to come, but I missed it. So Arta is working the entire ship and keeping it running with the mechanic's help. They get on well because she doesn't insist on them talking and is about as obsessed with the job as he is and they can have conversations where they both know what the other is on about in terms of mechanics. Since both have 5 dots, we were using WAD, in mechanics and spec in a spaceships, so there was some overlap there, but we agreed out of character we'd both do the regular everyday stuff then I'd step down so she could do the cool shit and build ships and cool gadgets while did more basic stuff since I also had the huge Iron Man thing going on that I could play with, so we had our niches. So one day I'm working on the ship, when I hear something going on in the area, now in ship terms I'm in the middle of bumfuck nowhere in the cargo area, so it's probably rats or something, I don't care. Then I feel something tap on my leg. So I'll turn around and there's this 8 year old girl looking up at me. I look at her for about 2-3 seconds. Then Neil. Take out my pad and write what are you doing here little girl she reads it and I expect her to answer with words. She doesn't. She signs out I'm looking for my teddy bear holy shit a little deaf girl. What the fuck are you doing in the engineering oh well. So my character decides to be a bro and asks her where her bear might be. We go looking for the bear, never find it but we search all day. Turns out she's one of the refugees. Long story short my character ends up all big daddy. Tramping about with a little girl sitting on his shoulders looking for the bear. She has a riot of a time and enjoys the day with me as we search the entire ship for this bear. I was like the opposite of pretty. I was the phantom of the opera. Multiplied by a gargoyle to the power of electric burns. Arta was so hideous from chemical, electrical, cigarette burns, bacon slicer damage, knife marks, damage where bones had broken the skin and all sorts of other shit that he could crack space safe glass at 50 paces, causing the entire room to vent killing everyone in it. I had a 6 page list of everything that had been done to him and the exact effects of it and where the scars were so I didn't end up just making shit up as I went along. And this was 10 years after the incident, when Mitchell saved him. He was like Griffith from Berserk after a year being tortured. So to cut a long weekend game shorter, it was a surprisingly nice balance between drama and kinda slice of life. Go figure. Eventually we run into another ship, which hails us and demands to search our hold claiming to be plain clothes police. The calculator is of course against this because he's got a cargo hull full of Narcota. We're all discussing it. Arta doesn't give a fuck. Mitchell wants to not run because we can't outrun them. When there's a sudden twist the refugee patriarch is watching the communication with us and tells us it's the criminals who are after him and his family. They're also a rival to the man whose daughter is with us. And suddenly the calculator is all like well that's fine then. Who cares if you all get killed right to his face. In front of this guy, me and the little girl. So everyone just looks at him, and the patriarch splutters for about a second and then breaks his weedy ass glass jaw about half a second before I go for him. And I decide the patriarch has a better reason so I'll let him kick shit out this dirt bag. It takes the doctor and Mitchell to drag him off him and the calculator runs, escaping the room with blood running down his face. We reassure the guy we're not going to turn them in, we can outrun them. When suddenly the ship starts powering down and redirecting towards the other ship. We all run for the cockpit, which is locked. Oh that Mathefica Mitchell orders him to open the fucking door. I turn and march off to my room and begin preparing by grabbing my shotgun. Ready to die in glorious space battle against the criminal scum. He doesn't open the door. Screaming about how he knew we couldn't be trusted and how we were going to betray him from the start and so on and so forth. The mechanic realizes the door can be overridden by resetting some of the subsystems and goes to do it, only to find out that all the systems have been rerouted to the calculator's handheld computer. So he's taken command of the entire ship, without asking permission or any warning. The crazy fuck. 
out of character we're all like the fuck you doing and the player tries to justify it as his paranoia tray and his character having an episode. And we're all like dude, not cool it's how he'd act he whined. And the GM backs him up. Mitchell is furious at this but we can't do much about it. Until the power suddenly goes off and the mechanic returns to the door with an arch welder. Like the no fucks given. Badass she is and starts cutting through the door. They cut through the door. And find a walkie talkie in that the ship is being controlled by remote. Like everything else. FFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFF
So, I, being the only space competent one, suit up and head over to the other ship, leaving the cockpit open so I can return, since I can't call for them to open it. We get some nice shit and everyone appears to be dead. So hey, bonus no need to waste shotgun shells. 4 hours later. The calculator is still in the brig and nothing has happened, but we're only a day or two from planet side. Artie meanwhile gets hammered as shit on some vodka that he found on the other ship, along with Mitchell, while they bitch about how special and our new crew is and laugh about old times working as a dynamic duo. Arta can't drink as well as Mitchell, who plans to go for at least another hour or two, when Arta goes to bed. He locks his room door as always to avoid inquisitive people entering while he's undressed and hits bunk. An hour or so later there's shouting and banging on his door. Not sure exactly how it happened, but one of the criminals escaped, has Mitchell hostage and is now screaming that he wants our escape pod to escape in with a knife against his throat and the kitchen. Yes, this John McClane of Villian survived total decompression and managed to sneak onto our ship undetected, hide there for 4 hours unnoticed and then take a hostage. However, now he fucked up. Because no one fucks with Mitchell. The doctor is currently running hostage negotiation, when one of the mercenaries appears with the calculator in tow, saying he's the only one who can help us or think of a plan. And I realize what this is, an attempt at trial by far to get us to work together. And finally I take a shot of that sweet, sweet whiskey out of character because the game has finally reached terminal stupid velocity the calculator comes out with a plan the GM obviously fed him about pumping the air out the room until the hostage taker faints. It's a danger to Mitchell too, but not as dangerous as breathing through a hole in his neck. So we prepare. Arta doesn't trust the calculator, I wonder why at this point, and disappears to enact his own plan. The doctor keeps him talking while the mechanic keeps an eye on the calculator without him noticing, watching what he's doing. Arta meanwhile arms up with his shotgun, Sasha and goes to do what he does best. Crawl around in small vents and fix shit. So I roll and find a vent leading into the kitchen from above. The GM points out the vents are much too small for a normal human. I retort with the fact I've taken the mostly useless tunnel rat merit which lets me crawl wherever I fancy pretty much without penalites. He says my armor is way too bulky, so Arta, knowing Mitchell is in mortal danger, does the most logical thing and strips down naked apart from a small oxygen canister and his gun and starts crawling through the vents, because I am not letting the GM railroad us into having the calculator's way be the only way when Mitchell is Arta's friend he switches back to the other group for a bit and the calculator is private messaging the GM in the background and he casually mentions how Mitchell might not survive this unless he does it perfectly so don't blame him if it goes wrong. We're down to 75% cabin pressure in the kitchen which is sealed off and the hostage taker is starting to slur. 70% he threatens to kill Mitchell unless we get the escape pod in less than 5 minutes. 60% Mitchell faints due to blood loss from being attacked by a murderous, desperate knife wielding criminal and lack of oxygen. 50% the hostage taker drops the knife and is swaying like a bitch. And it keeps going down as the calculator lies about him being down, as, as far as he knows, he's the only one with camera view. What he doesn't know is that Arta is watching from inside a vent and the mechanic is looking over his shoulder from a distance as he says he'll have to drop it even lower, obviously planning to acid until he kill Mitchell. So Arta Kool-Aid bands out the vent and gives Mitchell, his best friend who is currently dying on the floor, the oigen mask while holding his breath as the room explosively decompresses. And he grabs the knife and jabs a hole in the kitchen door seal. As the mechanic finally clicks and shouts out what the calculator is trying to do and grabs the PDA. Reversing the decompression. Leaving Mitchell on heel so low it will take a month in game for him to heal up. Health so low that a good kick would end him now. Arta turns and kneels down on the back of the hostage taker as the door opens and for the first time the others see him without his suit, looking like the space version of Victor Zass, knelt on this guy with a knife in his hand. The mercenaries go to point their guns at me and get me off him because for some reason this motherfucker must be taken alive. No. Not this time. Arta might not stand up for himself but he will pull you limb from limb for hurting Mitchell, which this man has done. So he puts the knife in his throat and pulls it across. 
and the GM suddenly decides that this loss of life is a horrific thing and I feel like a monster for it and drama drama ability and tells me my character will have nightmares later. And I'm like no, you can't tell me how my character feels, he tried to kill Mitchell. I have no guilt at all about this. This guy broke the rules, outright into his face. GM bitches a bit in the mercenaries, once again. Trained and professional murderers who work for a fucking crime boss and have already mentioned they've broken legs before and crap. Look at me as if I'm Norman Bates. Considering I'm currently the naked patchwork man I can see why the others are shocked. But those guys when the GM has been bringing them across as hard as nails cynical badasses as he brings across all soldier types the fuck anyway. The calculator then steps forward and starts to give this long spiel about how he saved the day and obviously is the only competent one here and should be released and be captain and then the mechanic girl points out what he tried to do. And Arta gets up, using the table as both his kneecaps are fucked from being drilled through in the past. The suit isn't just for hiding himself. It also supports all the damaged areas, turns and looks at him balefully, with his one good eye, which is black as hell itself and his milky burned eye which a mafia torturer put out a cigarette in once, and Mitchell saved him from that ignoble fate, which he didn't earn, he fell in love and was nearly killed for it and Mitchell gave up his future to save him, he could have turned his back on him and left him, one more corpse on the road to greatness, but he didn't. He risked his life to defy an entire planet of criminals and scum to save Arta's life. And has paid for it ever since in every day that he has worked nose to the grindstone in the ass end of space instead of being one of the richest, most powerful people in that section of the galaxy. And this Mathefica just tried to kill Mitchell. He makes a move out the way gesture to the others, who all move back quickly out his way, leaving the calculator standing alone, shocked that he was found out. He thought he was too clever to be caught. I can out of character the GM has the messerineries try to stop me and Mitchell shouts him down telling him they were just piss terrified of me and I roll intimidate. My one good social skill and get a bonus for being a hideous, mutilated figure with a heart of black ice and a bloodied knife in my hand. And then, as he goes to slime his way out of it or be clever, I smoothly draw up Sasha and turn his head into a hole in space. The mercenaries go to arrest me and throw me in the brig. Did the doctor and the mechanic stop them, as I carry Mitchell out the room silently, taking him to the nursing station and dragging the doctor with me. My camaraderie and friendship with this dickus of a man who saved my life overruling my embarrassment about everyone knowing my secret. Limping on the way there on damaged legs. He might have been clever, but he wasn't smart, and I have yet to meet man who can outsmart bullets. Only interesting incident after that during that arc was the little girl helping Arta out when something went wrong with the wiring and then wanting to stay with Arta and fly around space with them really when they hit planet side. But she was 8, she couldn't make that choice. Arta knelt down and shook his head and signed out the following. A message that would stay with her I like to think forever. You are young little one. You do not know what you want yet. If you joined us today, you would regret it tomorrow and miss your mother, your father, your family, your friends, for nothing is as important as a friend. You have much growing up to do and I am not a teacher, or a father and if I were, I would not be as good as your own, nor one to be proud of. This place is good and rich and peaceful. Grow up here, happy and free. The galaxy is large and wide and dark. There are many things in it that are sad, many broken people and many lost dream. You are young little one. 10 years younger than L. You have not yet been hardened by it or had to live through its pain. He removed his helmet at this point and smiled through his damaged face go. Live with your family. Live long. Eat. Drink. Dance. Live and love and know not the brutality of life. Grow up happy and content with the ground under your feet. And if one day, you still wish to return, to rejoin those of us who live, fight and die amongst the stars then we will be waiting for you, for you are as brave as a bear. My name is Artur Izvanov, Captain of Engineering of the Star Rider, ship serial code number 4979220. Come and find me, we will be waiting for you, amongst the stars, Nanooka, Janooka, it means little paw. And with that he removed the bear from his back pocket and handed it to her, then ruffled her blonde hair with one huge, calloused scarred hand, missing the two lowest fingers and stood up, turned and climbed back onto the ship, as it took off, 
standing there in her simple refugee rags on the edge of the Arcadian fields of the planet they had dropped them off on. She watched him all the way until the ramp closed, holding her bear. I'd like to say the game continued after that and that after a time skip, she joined them or returned, that the message was carved into the stone at the entrance of the village that family started on a statue of him that Arthur overcame his crudeness and hermetic ways and fear of people to become a better man, a hero of the people and made the universe better, that Arthur, Michiel, the doctor, the mechanic, the mafia princess and little Paul went on to have grand adventures and that the calculator was driven forever from the group. But no story ends so happily. The game trailed off after that. The GM deciding that the death of the PC he favored was enough to kill it. Even if we all hated the smug fucker and the calculator is still in our group. It appears to have learned that just because he's another PC doesn't mean the rest of us will put up with any shit from him. Not after that. He's walking a very fine line now. And that is the end of the tale of Arthur as it was. An ignoble ending to a bland game with few redeeming features beyond Michiel. Arta, the doctor and the mechanic. So I've recently moved Nick Bedia merch over to Teesprings and have a few new designs. Listings are below the video and in the description. Just stop! Just stop it! Stop! No! Just stop it! It's time to stop! It's time to stop, okay? No more! Where the fuck are your parents? Who are your parents? I'm gonna call Child Protective Services. It's time-